part one. Part one. You will hear Bud and Annie talking about their families. Look at questions one to five on the form now. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Annie. How are things? Awful, Bud. Awful. Why? What's happened? It's home. Mum's ill and Dad's been laid off, so he's in a really bad mood. And Susan won't be of any help. Your sister always was lazy. But what's wrong with your mum? She seemed fine last time I saw her. Everything. I think she's really down because of Dad. And her arthritis is playing up again. It seemed the new medicine was working fine. Now she can still move her fingers, but hardly walk. Her toes hurt, and the doctor says she needs a knee replacement. Doesn't sound too good. That's expensive surgery. Got medical insurance. She was covered by my dad's, but that's finished since he lost his job, and money's really tight. A new knee costs about ten thousand bucks, so she'll have to put up with it for a while. God, that's awful. Maybe I should mention it to my uncle, the one who used to work at the hospital. What could he do? I don't know, but he knows all the doctors, and maybe there's a way your mum could get the operation done cheaply. It'll have to be really cheap, because they're having a problem paying the mortgage, and my sister won't help out. She's so selfish. Well, I'll give a try,、uh, but what's this problem with your sister? Since she won that beauty competition, she thinks she's been acting so high and mighty. Won't even help Mum with the housework. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between Bud and Annie, and answer questions six to ten. Won't help your mum. No, spends all her time in front of the mirror trying on different lipsticks. Sounds like my cousin. You know her, I think. Marianne works at the Holiday Inn. Yeah, I met her at your party, but she seemed very nice. She is till you get to know her, Miss Charming. But she's really conceited, especially since she got promoted. Always putting people down. What about your dad's company? Do you think he might have some work for my dad, part time, anything? He just got this big contract for the new supermarket, so he might be looking for some people. And I know he likes your dad, but all his workers have to be steelworkers union members. I think Dad's kept his membership up. I'll ask him. Let me know, and I'll check with Dad when he gets back from France. France? Yeah, he took Mum there as a twenty-fifth wedding anniversary present. Gosh, it's five thirty. I'm late for work. Got to fly. See you, Bud. See you. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a bank manager talking about money management. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk. 
answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the Hong Kong's bank's lectures on money management. I'm John Rogers, and I'm the manager here. Money, they say, makes the world go round. Well, it is true that your world can come to a grinding halt if you have no money. I know you all agree, because that is why you have come here today. Okay, money. What do we want to do with it? Most people want to enjoy the money they earn today, but also put some aside for a rainy day, the kids' education, that big house in the country you've always dreamed of, and, of course, retirement. In other words, they want to invest it. So let's talk for a little while on spending money wisely today, and then I'll talk about the various types of investment you can make. The first question is, how much of your income should you enjoy spending today, and how much should you save for the future? And the answer is different for different people. It depends on things like age, your health, how many children you have, etc. Well, my initial answer is, write out a budget for the necessities. Food, rent, mortgage, and loan payments, clothing, health insurance, things like that. When most people do this, they say to themselves, my goodness, I really only need to spend 1,500 pounds a month. So how come I always spend nearly two and a half thousand? My mother used to tell me, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. What to do? Discipline. I suggest you take out the cash you need every week from the bank and keep a record of what you buy with your credit card. And you must strictly limit what you spend every month to, for example, your budget for essentials, plus an amount, say, 10%, for a bit of entertainment, if you want, and the unexpected, like house repairs, that birthday present you forgot about, things like that. If after three weeks you find that you have nearly spent your budget for the month, then stay at home for a week, no fancy restaurants or drinking with the boys. As they say, there's no free lunch. As the talk continues, please answer questions 16 to 20. Okay, so what do you do with the money you don't spend? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. It's a good idea to always have some money in a current deposit at the bank in case of big surprises, say a thousand or so. Don't be tempted to use your credit card unless you absolutely have to. And get that safety cushion back in the bank as soon as you can. Right, so what should you invest in? The list is endless. Real estate, stocks and shares, equity funds. Did I hear someone say gambling? Well, if you have a crystal ball, maybe. The government lottery? Someone once described it as a voluntary tax on fools. But I must admit, I spend a pound or two on it every week. But no more. It brings a little bit of excitement into my life. Even though I know I have a better chance of being struck by lightning than winning. Okay, let's start off with a basic principle. In general, the higher the potential for making a fortune by buying shares of a particular company the one you have been told will be the next IBM in three weeks, the higher the risk. We've all heard about the dot-com bubble of several years ago. Some people made a fortune, but they got out before the market crashed. The majority of investors lost their shirts. Another basic principle, the balanced portfolio. A balanced portfolio means you have investments in a variety of things, from low-risk but low-return things, to things like blue-chip stocks that are somewhat less predictable, but which will probably provide steady, if not spectacular, returns for years, to the riskiest of all, venture capital, where success could increase the value of your investment a hundredfold, or failure could wipe it out. Well, why don't we break for a coffee now? Then I will talk about the most common form of share ownership, common stock, which makes you become a part owner of the company itself, with voting rights and entitlement to dividend distribution, if there is one. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3. You will hear a conversation between a student, Andrew, and a student advisor, Monica, about a diploma course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, I was told to come here for advice about um, management diploma courses. You've certainly come to the right place. Hi, uh, my name is Monica. N nice to meet you. My name is Andrew, Andrew Harris. So, Andrew, have you seen our diploma course prospectus yet? Yes, I've already looked at it. In fact, I thought the information on course content was really useful. But I'm afraid I'm a bit confused by all the different ways you can do the course. Full-time, intensive, part-time, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if I can help. I think each course type has its advantages and disadvantages, so it really depends on you, your own study habits, and your financial circumstances, of course. Are you working at the moment? Yes, I've been working in the administration section of the local hospital for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And before that, I worked in the office of a computer engineering company for two years. So I've got about five years of relevant work experience. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hoping to focus on is personnel management. I see. And are you planning to leave your current job to study, or are you thinking about just taking a year off? I want to know what my options are, really. I don't want to quit my job or anything. And my employers are keen for me to get some more qualifications, but obviously it would be better if I could do a course without taking too much time away from work. Right. So you don't really want to do the full-time course, then? No, not really. It's also a question of finances. You see, my office have agreed to pay the cost of the course itself, but I would have to take unpaid leave if I want to study full-time, and, well, I don't think I could afford to support myself with no salary for a whole year. Mm, OK. Well, you have two other possibilities. You could either do the part-time course, that would be over two years, and you wouldn't have to take any time off work, or you could do what we call a modular course. You could do that in 18 months if you wanted, or longer. It's quite flexible, and it would be up to you. Hmm. Uh, so what does the part-time course involve? For that, you would join an evening class and have a lecture twice a week. Then you'd have to attend a seminar or discussion workshop one weekend a month. What kind of coursework would I have to do? Well, it's a mixture. You'd be expected to write an essay each month, which counts towards your final assessment. You have a case study to do by the end of the course, which might involve doing a survey or, or something like that. And also, you need to hand in a short report every four weeks. So that's quite a lot of work, then, on top of working every day. It sounds like a lot of studying and really tiring. Yeah, you certainly wouldn't have much free time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. What about the modular course? What would I have to do for that? Well, that's where you get the opportunity to study full-time for short periods. That way you can cover a lot of coursework and attend lectures and seminars during the day. And each module lasts for one term, say, about 12 weeks at a time. There are obvious advantages in this, the main one being that you can study in a much more intensive way, which suits some people much better. And how many of these modules would I have to do to get the diploma? The current programme is two modules, and then you have to choose a topic to work in more depth. But you can base that on your job, and so you don't need to be away from the office. And how long it takes is up to you. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that you don't have to study and work. You can focus on one thing at a time. Yes, I can see that. It certainly sounds attractive. It would be more expensive, though. I mean, I'd have to support myself without pay for each module. Mm -hmm, that's true, so that might be a problem for you. Look, why don't you talk this over... That is the end of part three. 
You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part 3. Part 4. You will hear part of a lecture given by an economist about North American women's attitude to money and saving. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Okay, so we've been looking at the attitudes of various social and cultural groups towards the management of their personal finances, how important they feel it is to save money, and what they save their money for. One aspect that we haven't yet considered is gender. So if we consider gender issues, we're basically asking whether men and women have different attitudes towards saving money, and whether they save money for different things. Back in 1928, the British writer George Bernard Shaw wrote in his Intelligent Women's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism that a man is supposed to understand politics, economics, and finance, and is therefore unwilling to accept essential instruction. He also said, a woman, having fewer pretensions, is far more willing to learn. Now, though these days people might question a lot of the assumptions contained in those statements, recent research does suggest that there are some quite fundamental differences between men and women in their attitudes to economic matters. Let's look at what men and women actually save for. Research studies of women in North America have found that women are far more likely to save for their children's education, and they are also more likely to save up in order to buy a house one day. The same studies have found that men, on the other hand, tend to save for a car, which, by the way, takes a surprisingly large amount of the household budget in North America. But the other main priority for men when saving money is their retirement. When they're earning, they're far more likely to put money aside for their old age than women are. Now, this is rather disturbing, because, in fact, the need for women to save for their old age is far greater than for men. Let's consider this for a moment. To start with, it is a fact that throughout the world, women are likely to live many years longer than men, so they need money to support them during this time. Since women are likely to be the ones left without a partner in old age, they may, therefore, have to pay for nursing care because they don't have a spouse to look after them. Furthermore, the high divorce rates in North America are creating a poverty cycle for women. It is the divorced women who will most often have to look after the children, and thus they need more money to look after not just themselves, but others. So what can be done about this situation? The population in North America is likely to contain an increasing number of elderly women. The research indicates that at present, for women it takes a crisis to make them think about their future financial situation. But of course, this is the very worst time for anyone to make important decisions. Women today need to look ahead, think ahead, not wait until they're under pressure. Even women in their early 20s need to think about pensions, for example, and with increasing numbers of women in professional positions, there are signs that this is beginning to happen. Then research also suggests that women avoid dealing effectively with their economic situation because of a lack of confidence. The best way for them to overcome this is by getting themselves properly informed so they are less dependent on other people's advice. A number of initiatives have been set up to help them do this. This college, for example is one of the educational institutions which offers night classes in money management, and increasing numbers of women are enrolling on such courses. Here, they can be given advice on different ways of saving. 
Many women are unwilling to invest in stocks and shares, for instance, but these can be extremely profitable. It is usually advised that at least 70% of a person's savings should be in low-risk investments, but for the rest, financial advisors often advise taking some well-informed risks. Initiatives such as this can give women the economic skills and knowledge they need for a comfortable, independent retirement. The increasing proportion of that is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Here are some tips on how to increase your focus on IELTS reading. Eliminate distractions. When you are practicing IELTS reading, find a quiet place where you won't be interrupted. Turn off your phone, close any unnecessary tabs on your computer, and let your family or friends know that you need some time to focus. Set a timer. The IELTS reading test is timed, so it's important to practice working under pressure. Set a timer for 60 minutes and try to complete a practice passage in that time. As you get better, you can try to reduce the amount of time you give yourself. Skim the passage first. Before you start answering the questions, skim the passage quickly to get a general idea of what it's about. This will help you to understand the context of the questions and make it easier to find the answers. Use a pencil to track your progress. As you're reading, use a pencil to underline keywords and phrases. This will help you to stay focused on the passage and make it easier to find the information you need when you're answering the questions. Don't be afraid to reread. If you don't understand something, don't be afraid to reread it. It's better to take a little extra time to make sure you understand the passage than to risk making a mistake on a question. Here are some additional tips that may help you to improve your focus. Get enough sleep. When you're well rested, you're better able to focus and concentrate. Aim for 7 to 8 hours of sleep per night. Eat a healthy breakfast. Eating a nutritious breakfast will give you the energy you need to focus and perform your best. Avoid sugary cereals and pastries, and opt for something with protein and complex carbohydrates, such as eggs, oatmeal, or yogurt. Take breaks. It's important to take breaks when you're studying, especially if you're feeling tired or unfocused. Get up and move around every 20 to 30 minutes, or take a short walk outside exercise regularly. Exercise is a great way to improve your overall health and well-being, 